team pitch. Um, I'm going to do the, the introduction and then my colleagues from the OU will, will take um, the centre part of the paper and then I will wrap it up uh, towards the end. Uh, as a preamble to the, the presentation, I think it's important and to just emphasise and for us to recognise that um, entrepreneurship education um, across uh, the education sectors, uh, each of the levels, is important. Um, research which we cite in the paper uh, undertaken by uh, BIS um, uh, fairly much draws attention to the fact that uh, it improves or increases the quality and quantity of individuals in, engaging in this particular activity uh, and it has a very definite contribution to economic development and community development. So we want to recognise the importance of this within the context of social enterprise. Um, and one of the points that also came across in, in the earlier presentations was, uh, my colleague Professor Mason, was this idea about widening participation. And I think that's something that which we will want to take out or bring out in, in our paper. And hopefully I'm going to do this correctly. Excellent. So um, I suppose another issue that I will refer to again is also the uh, development of quality assessments. Uh, the QAA has been particularly significant in terms of determining standards for entrepreneurship education. And um, the Institute of Small Business and Entrepreneurship, among others, were, were very active, uh, colleagues from these institutes were very active in actually bringing forward these standards. So in a sense, certainly within the context of higher education, and we are, our aim in the papers you can see really is to explore the role of learning, design and technology in delivering effective entrepreneurship education, but our focus is within higher education institutions. But that's not to gain say the ideas that uh, what we have to share with you has implications and contributions for other levels um, across the education sector. But the structure of our presentation, um, very briefly, is to um, uh, focus on a vision and challenges as presented within policy um, statements uh, from, from uh, this assembly. Uh, my colleagues then will look at it from the point of view of, of the Open University's work in learning design and technology, and then I'll, I'll hopefully have time to, to wrap it up. I should probably take this opportunity to thank my my friend James Stewart here for helping me uh, uh, dredge through all the material that was available in terms of policy documents, and a lot of them are cited as footnotes, so hopefully that will um, uh, help. Uh, the reference there to enterprise and entrepreneurship is sometimes uh, one that causes difficulties. Um, uh, within the QAA document, uh, the reference is oftentimes we use enterprise or entrepreneurship in, in pretty much similar contexts, although some people will separate them out and talk about enterprising people, but then use entrepreneurship as a reference to venturing, you venturing, for example. Uh, I won't go into the uh, wider implications of research in this space. It's a, a debate that can uh, take up pretty much most of our afternoon, and some of us will support uh, each other and others will object. Um, uh, but uh, hopefully I'll bring out some of these issues around how we understand uh, these terms as, as we go through. Probably, I'll, I'll look now just at these issues around vision. Um, I think this particular quote captured some very important issues for us whenever we started looking at some of the policy statements that came uh, from uh, this assembly. The idea that uh, the very future prosperity of our society and our economy uh, really depended on not just our young people, but the brightest and the best, uh, and their parents buying into the, the relevancy of business and even new business venturing uh, as a, val a valuable and viable career alternative. I mean, Northern Ireland has been, in many respects, um, characterised uh, by that uh, temptation for many of our graduates to look for secure uh, jobs within the professions, the medical profession, solicitors, accountancy. So this is the, a default position. And parents, you can imagine, who have invested an incredible amount, not just in terms of emotional capital, but presumably financial capital, they're keen to see that their investment is not squandered or risked. Um, and this is an issue. I mean, some PhD research that I've just completed recently in terms of supervising this research is in the context of um, young women uh, who are um, seeking to start their own business or going to self-employment. And the reaction of their parents to their ambitions uh, is both startling and alarming. Um, and in many respects, we recognise, and research recognises that women, of course, um, interse intersectionality theory recognises that women fa face a sort of a double bind here. But, but to have your parents not in your corner, I guess, is, is going to be, in some respects, a, a restraint. So, so you can see how that quote, I think, is particularly relevant in this particular context, and, and we're keen to, um, 
to understand that as a contextual issue. So we're talking about then creating a culture and an environment in Northern Ireland uh, by which it might prosper, or as a consequence it might prosper, by using its knowledge, its skills, its capacity. I'm drawing really from the Regional Innovation Strategy document there. And the emphasis is very much um, on research and development and innovation. Um, and I think it's uh, useful for us to, to recognise, and indeed in some of the documentation that uh, is brought forward, excuse me, some of the documentation that's brought forward in the, our comments on that, it refers to the successful generation and exploitation of new ideas is the interpretation of what innovation is within the regional economic, or regional innovation strategy. Um, so it's, first of all, focusing on innovation and R&D, and it's absolutely focusing on this idea of um, the idea of uh, exploitation of that innovation. And certainly our universities, and indeed universities throughout the UK, are very active in exploiting uh, the outcomes or outputs of our innovation. Um, and one particular strategy, probably the most popular one, is to actually leverage value by introducing that technology to third parties who themselves take it perhaps to Palo Alto in California or to Frankfurt in Germany and leverage value from it. My concern is that we're not getting the value of that here in Northern Ireland. We, we get the royalties in our universities, of course, but that's not quite the same as far as uh, I, would, uh, I would suggest anyway. Um, it's also important, uh, I mean, it, it, I, a point that I picked up from, from the material was that you know, we are providing an additional 300 a PhD positions, just take that as one little item from, from material that we, I picked up from, from James and his colleagues, and that was particularly useful. And by 2020, the ambition of some 1,000 PhDs, I guess, across the, the universities here, which is particularly important. But we need to really see the development of entrepreneurship education really within our science, engineering, and technology faculties. I mean, this is really where we're more likely to get the ideas that are going to change the world uh, to come from. Um, but we need to also explore ways in which, and again I'm beginning to hopefully hint at the distinct, a distinction here, we need to develop the entrepreneurial potential of graduates and undergraduates uh, in these uh, science, engineering and technology faculties, and indeed beyond, which brings us into this idea of a lifelong learning uh, commitment, that it's not over just because you've done the PhD although it does feel like that, I have to say, as I recall uh, my own experience. Uh, but it's coming back to recognising, I mean, some of you may have seen the article in The Observer a couple of weeks ago, which actually celebrates the success of Northern Ireland in this space. And we have the Northern Ireland Science Park. It's a particularly useful demonstration of what we can do. Uh, but I think the position we are trying to present here is that we haven't uh, yet done nearly enough. And I think that's the issue. And you know, in many respects, the likes of the Science Park is almost an exception still. And it'd be wonderful if we could get to the point where that was closer to a norm. Uh, this uh, piece of statistics here, really coming from the BAIS uh, research, really just looks a little bit at uh, the um, uh, students' attitudes uh, to enterprise. And um, you can see there that uh, Northern Ireland is above the UK average. Um, well, not nearly, according to the definition uh, at the very bottom there, we need to get close to 10 if we're going to see uh, the prospects of people really taking the step into entrepreneurial new venturing uh, as an increasing norm. And I have a little issue around the notion about student attitudes. I mean, within the QAA standards for entrepreneurship education, the, there is a distinction struck between studying entrepreneurship or studying um, Studying in a way it's about entrepreneurship or studying for entrepreneurship. So there's a distinction here where we, we study entrepreneurship but we're not really expecting anything necessarily to happen. We're building awareness. Uh, and then it's, it's uh, learning for entrepreneurship where we have an expectation that something actually is going to change. And that has a definite uh, implication for the uh, construction of curriculum uh, and for the learning experience of the student. Um, I don't have scope to bring to go into that. Perhaps that's an issue we can raise in the question and answer series. So the challenges that we face, I think, really, is I see one of the challenges. Gosh, uh, these challenges are huge. Uh, but one of the challenges certainly is to try and explore how we can bring the future forward. And um, there's enough research. Some research I've done myself with colleagues at the University of Edinburgh literally look at the fact that you know our average uh, entrepreneurial new venture coming out of university, going through an entrepreneurial apprenticeship. Uh, might be in his, his or her mid-30s 
uh, before they finally decide that they need or want to actually um, do something for themselves. So we want to see how can we possibly get uh, more students to think in terms of starting a business while at university uh, or certainly after graduation. And uh, it's to be recognised, I think, as well, that those who actually come up with these innovations, those who do the PhD work and come out with the great ideas, um, we have a lot of research going on at Ulster in the area of diabetics and diabetic management. Um, they're not necessarily the ones that are going to start the businesses. You know, they've joined universities because they want to be academics. You know, and um, they might want to be sleeping partners in new ventures, but that's a totally different experience. So how do we get to a point where we can marry these innovators with entrepreneurs? And I'm again striking a difference between the two constituents. And we have megabucks going into innovation and R&D. Um, what are we doing to get those exciting people who will leverage value from those innovations? Uh, we have a context in Northern Ireland that we have to try to um, obviously uh, undo. We have a generation uh, lost in a sense to enterprise which we are trying to resolve. We know the contexts that are here. The entrepreneurship, uh, the education system has a role to play here in terms of curriculum development, appropriate curriculum development for as opposed to about entrepreneurship and um, we need to build uh, at the university business interface. So those are issues that are important here. So we're moving towards increasing, we want to move towards the increasing the numbers of students starting businesses. It's all about widening that participation and that brings us towards the idea of learning design and technologies. And I'd like to ask my colleague, uh, Richard um, Blundell, just to take it from there. Okay, so Porrex talked a lot about the, the challenges uh, uh, in, in bringing the future forward and, and the, the scale of the, the challenge. So is there anything in the sense of uh, new learning designs and new technologies that can help to kind of accelerate this process? Um, we're going to give a few examples here, um, just to, uh, uh, suggestions really of, of, of ways uh, this might be achieved. So there's a graph here, which I'm not sure if everyone will be able to see, um, but just to explain, this, this is uh, some data. I'm using open university examples here, not simply to blow our own trumpet, but just to, to give illustrations of things that other universities are doing too. Um, this is iTunes U, the uh, Apple site, and the Open University, along with other universities, has been involved in iTunes, uh, this iTunes U, providing university materials on, on, uh, on this site uh, that can be freely downloaded. Uh, the OU started in 2008, at the left-hand side there, uh, so with no downloads, uh, and you'll see the figures uh, in 2013 uh, are approaching 70 million downloads. So it just gives you an indication of the scale that can be achieved using technologies that simply weren't available a few years ago. Um, now that sounds impressive. There's also YouTube again, which you know we kind of assume it's kind of been there for, for years, but actually again quite a recent thing. But the YouTube channels that our university and other universities have are also another source of this kind of material. Um, so that's great. It's really exciting, but it's it really is not enough. Um, just getting this sort of transmissive type of education, sort of sending materials down the line, is, is I say, is impressive, but it won't transform uh, the lives of individuals. So what else can technology do? Well, other recent technologies, um, I've got my slightly out of date example here, would be smartphones. Um, so as well as uh, online education being provided through your PC or laptop, you know, obviously with a, with a smartphone, see someone's photographing us at the moment, um, with his smartphone, um, you can turn what was you know, a, a device for, for one type of communication into a learning device that you can take anywhere with you. And I think I was watching uh, last night on television, I think there was a meeting actually in this, in this room possibly, uh, invo yeah, involving young people uh, and their use of uh, smartphones and tablets, actually in the sense of protecting, protecting their, their, their use, but um, it just indicates that this is a, such a prevalent technology now. And so, this really does open up new learning opportunities because people have got their smartphone everywhere when they're at work, when they're at school, when they're with their friends. There's all sorts of new opportunities that weren't, simply weren't there before. So I'm just going to conclude my, my section with just an example of what in the OU we call a learning journey and just how maybe people could be taken along a path towards, in, this, in the case of our topic today, an engagement with entrepreneurship. So um, just by happy coincidence, uh, this is an example that's kind of live at the moment. 
there's a TV program on, on BBC Four currently. The, the, last, the second episode of three was on last night. Uh, it's called Hidden Histories, Britain's Oldest Family Businesses. Uh, and I happen to have been the advise, academic advisor to the, the program, so I'm, again, just sort of promoting our cause. Um, but this is, so this is for a really quite a wide audience, a television program where people are taken through the lives of, uh, the, the, the histories of their businesses. Um, but in a sense, it sort of sugars the pill for some very, you know, quite interesting kind of learning around things like the resilience of businesses over the years. These are businesses that have lasted hundreds of years. They're really exceptional cases, but they teach some more general lessons and challenge some, some ideas. Also about the tensions within a family business as well, which are discussed uh, the program last night um, uh, discussed that. I won't go into any detail now, but um, uh, do, do go and have a look at it on uh, the iPlayer if, um, if, if you didn't see it. Um, but the learning journey, that would take a proportion of people that maybe watch the program. At the end of the program, there's a call to action where people are invited to, if, you're, if you found this interesting, follow, you know, go to the BBC site and follow the links to the Open University. Um, that would then take uh, the, the viewer to the OpenLearn website of the Open University, where we've put additional resources around the topics of business history, actually, in this case, and resilience of, of, of small businesses. And it could take them further into some actual learning opportunities that are perhaps more active. So, for example, there is uh, excerpts from our MBA course available on OpenLearn so that people can go through some, some, some materials, sort of podcast-type materials, and, and be asked some questions and so on. So, that's just an example of, of, of one way of kind of getting people engaged through, through a learning journey. So as, as time is short, I'll now pass on to uh, my colleague, Kristen. Thank you. I, I think, you know, it's really impressive to look at, you know, 70 million downloads and, you know, how we can turn um, our smartphones into learning devices. But some of the thinking that we have, um, that we've had um, at the Open University, and of course um, in education in general, actually, is that um, it, it's a different way of learning. Um, you know, we're, we're really starting to see that, um, you know, learning isn't this kind of transmissive, uh, sending information out, people absorbing it, and, and that makes the change. It, learning has to be active and transmissive, I mean, uh, and transformative, actually. Um, and, uh, you know, in some ways, it's, it's providing that kind of sandbox, that, that safe area for, children, adults, adult learners, and other students to, to be able to try, try things out, to test them out, and then um, really develop that kind of risk attitude that lets them um, take advantage of the innovations that are happening. Um, I just wanted to quickly go to some of these ideas here that um, embody some of what we have is, is kind of the, the fundamentals of the learning design behind what we do. Um, one is that it's experiential, and that's that, that act of learning, of, of allowing someone to test it out, whether it's through a role play within a classroom or um, whether it's something that they're actually doing in practice. It's something that someone is learning, they're putting it into practice, they're testing it out. So it's not just something that they read in a book, and you know, that's the learning. They're actually getting to see how it's relevant to the context that they're learning about. Um, another is that I think this captures maybe something that Teresa was saying about the little c, that you're trying to engender some, some discussion and, and um, activity around creativity, that that's a really big part of it, particularly when we're talking about entrepreneurial learning. And also there's this idea of developing core skills that entrepreneurial learning isn't just um, developing innovation or developing creativity, but there are some really important core skills, uh, some of what Pork was saying about um, education for enterprise. And then also there's uh, you know, virtual learning spaces, these online learning spaces that um, you can have then that bring people together, that bring that network of peers together to, to learn together. So I have a, a short little scenario that I'd like to run through um, that might help to, to um, show you and illustrate what we're talking about. So Jenny is a researcher at a local university and she's developed a new, solar, a new type of solar cell. And um, her supervisor 
Uh, she, what she really wants to do, you know, she's been doing a lot of really good research, but she hasn't really understood the practical implications of that. What are the, um, how, how can you actually take this to market? What are the commercial ways that this can have an impact in the community? So her supervisor asks her to, uh, or suggests for her to take an, an enterprise creation course that they have at the university in the business school. And um, she joins this course. It's, part, it's a blended course, so part of it is in the classroom, but a lot of it is online. And it's developed so that um, she'll have access to people all over the world. Um, so there are some, and as she joins the course, she realizes that there are a lot of like-minded students in the course, but they all have different experiences. They're not all in math and technology, for example. And so um, she's interacting with people that have many, many different experiences. Um, some, some of the key features of the course then are uh, a particular, one is an online forum where they have guest entrepreneurs, not only from the local community, but from uh, countries all around the world coming in to discuss with the students uh, different ideas that they have, um, experiences that they have in starting businesses and so forth. And so it's not just the, the classroom or the virtual classroom, but they're really getting contact with what's going on in the world. Through that, she learns that there's a local cluster of sustainable technology businesses, and she makes that link beyond the, the course to networks inside her local community. There's also a virtual new venture challenge, kind of like an online dragon's den, and that activity is part of the assessment for the course. And together, she works with other students in the course to develop a, an app for people to manage their electricity at home. And so there she realizes that the people, the community, the local community, the users of this technology all have to be involved in the development process. Um, the group tests their idea through the enterprise development process and learn, all of them learn that they can take these risks, that they can make mistakes, and learn some solutions for, doing, for, for solving them. There's this cross-fertilization in the group because she's working with people from different backgrounds. And in the process, she also builds core skills in presentation, business acumen, how to develop a business plan, um, how to involve other stakeholders in the development process. And she realizes that this is something that she could actually do, that she could actually take her idea and put it into practice. The course also includes a digital storytelling element where um, people that the professor knows um, in different countries around the world have created videos that they tell their story about how they developed a business. And so she watches a video of a Hungarian who's taken an idea for a sustainable water filtration system and has worked with his local community to develop it. It got a, a view from the, uh, the EU and so they now have a grant and they're developing it across. And she realizes that there's an even broader network that she could get in contact with. <coughs> And so through this process of this one course, she's actually realized that there's an opportunity and a network and a community that she can work with. And then that learning is actually social, that it's not just her in her, in her area, in her, in her, uh, with her solar cell working, but that taking this to fruition is a, is a social process. So really, I mean, just, just as, a, as a quick roundup, um, it's thinking about how we engage people in active learning and the digital technology allows this, it affords it, but it's not the be all and end all. It's really how you design that learning to allow it to be contextualized for students and collaborate and allow them to collaborate with others. It's understanding that there are many different entry points in learning and it's not just a degree that you take and then become, you know, you know enter a profession that we're continuously learning and that there are different opportunities to do so. And finally, that there are many different types of learning and, um, and that you can design education programs and the learning journey to allow people to take advantage of those as well. So I'll hand back to, to Pork to talk about some implications. At the University of Ulster, we've um, launched, in terms of our technology support, a business launch pad and an open Ulster knowledge portal as it tunes into some of the stuff that's been spoken about so far. We hope that we've gone some way to give you some insights to the work that's going on here, 
in terms of using technology to widen access as far as enterprise education as learning goes, that there's real potential for more, we haven't done half enough yet. There's a need for greater focus or emphasis and understanding that there's innovation, but there's also entrepreneurship, that there are stakeholders, uh, not just universities, but business and policymakers, um, that we need to understand how people learn and uh, adapt technology to help us in the process of individuals' processes of learning. Uh, and we need to monitor and evaluate what we do in terms of utilizing this technology so that we be constantly subjecting it to that critique that's necessary so that we can improve it on an ongoing basis. So thank you so much. Thank you.